Again, welcome to the public newsroom. Uh, it's a monthly digital workshop series where we uh, discuss and deconstruct uh, important local issues and highlight grassroots efforts to meet information needs. City Bureau, the organization that hosts the public newsrooms, is a nonprofit media organization that serves the South and West Sides. Uh, if you want to stick around until the end of the workshop, we'll recap the event and outline a couple ways that you can stay involved. We'll also follow up via email with a recording of the event and some ways that we can keep the conversation going. Uh, I want to introduce our guests for today. We are so lucky to be joined by um, several people who've been running really great mutual aid efforts across the city. First is Brittany Roll. She's a teacher at Butler College Prep. Uh, between Roslyn and Pullman, she ran Feed the People, which was a weekly distribution site a few blocks away from the school that gave out groceries and other supplies. Uh, Femdat, a rapper and founder of Delacreme Scholars, which was originally a scholarship for black and brown students at DePaul University that now runs the Scholars Slideby, a program where people can submit their grocery lists for delivery. Trina Reynolds Tyler, a data analyst, a recent graduate of um, the Harris School of Public Policy. Uh, she currently works at the Invisible Institute and co-runs the data for Black Lives Chicago Hub. She is also the founder of the People's Grab and Go, a pop-up pantry that has been giving away food, PPE, and other supplies every Monday since CPS announced that it would suspend its own food distribution network. Uh, the People's Grab and Go is based outside of Burke Elementary in Washington Park. And finally, moderating the conversation is Rosita Cox, a freelance documentary filmmaker and artist based in Chicago who works to partner with and center community members in her work. She helped organize Oasis on 95th, a food supply distribution site in Roseland, born out of the protests following the police murder of George Floyd. And shout out, Rosita is also an alum of uh, City Bureau's fellowship program. Uh, so today we'll be talking about mutual aid, how our guests got their food distribution efforts up and running, how they fit into the movement for Black Lives, how COVID-19 has shaped them, how you might start another mutual aid project yourself. Uh, so we'll kick things off with our panel and then we'll transition into an activity. Uh, before we do all that, does anyone have any questions? Great, uh, we'll let Rosita take it away. Thank you, Ellie. Um, hey, y'all. Thank y'all for uh, participating and joining us. I just want to call out a couple of things before we get started. My shirt says murder must stop. It does not just say murder. Um, <laughs> I was looking at it, it looks weird. Um, and secondly, the food distribution site um, that me and my friend set up, Oasis, uh, actually grew out of the People's Grab and Go, which was Trina's um, site. I just wanted to call that out and give her credit. Um, but with that being said, I would like for all of the panelists to um, kind of reintroduce yourself so everyone can get to know you a little bit better and tell us why and how your project got started. And if you could also include uh, what was the very first step that you took um, and I will popcorn to Trina to start that off. Sorry, I struggled to unmute myself for a second. So peace, y'all. My name is Trina Reynolds-Tyler, AKA Trinity Trill. Um, I actually like to call myself the co-founder of the People's Grab and Go because it literally would not have happened without the team leadership. That's Jaha Keparu, that's Dominique James, and that's Matt Muse, as well as all of the other people who showed up and showed out. That includes Rosita, Brittany, them like and and also Sarah Conway is on this call um who is absolutely a part of the first step for starting this project um we so on the eve of so I guess Dominique just reminded me of this uh yesterday or at our last grab and go meal site I mean at our last food distribution site but uh a couple of days before CPS has suspended um the grab and go um, pick up sites for CPS lunches. I reached out to Dominique and I said, hey, like, I think we could do some organizing around food. You love food, you love to cook. Like, please come to this thing. Cause I was hosting like a organizing like black folks meetup. Um, and then uh, 
somehow coincidentally, I think it was by the universe, the grab and go so after after the first protest around George Floyd in Chicago happened, CPS uh, decided to suspend their grab and go meal distribution sites. And my partner, he works at a, a school, uh, well, he works with the organization called 360 Nation. They are at Sumner Elementary. They actually do, he, he planned on going there the next day in order to give away food. Um, and he said, like, do you plan on doing anything tomorrow? And I was like, I'm not sure yet. I could not sleep. And in the morning, I like did a mass tweet. I was like, y'all, like, this is why I look at this because I saw the PDF with all of the closed meal sites. I said, like, look at this. This is a lot of sites. Like, there are a lot of people who thought they were going to get food who are just not going to get food today. And that's a problem. And after my barrage of tweets, Dominique called me and she said, I'm on my way to Costco. And I said, okay, all right, so this is what we're going to do. And then I got a couple other people on the phone. And um, really the first step was showing up. And like, I mean, like before that, we were like, we need to pick up what, where are we gonna go? You know, we decided to choose on an, um, we decided to choose a school that was in the network where we live because we live in the same network and we landed on Burke Elementary School. But I think really the big, the big thing that got the project started was like showing up to the location. Um, it was challenging, like it was raining that day. So we didn't know what was gonna happen. Sarah can probably, I mean, I'm sure Sarah, Sarah knows this because she was out there with us, but like, we were like, oh, it's gonna rain in a couple of minutes. Like, what are we gonna do? Are we gonna stay or are we gonna leave? And ultimately this, the decision was, it doesn't matter if we just give 10 people, five people food today, that's a success. So that's, that's my piece. Thank you. Thank you, Trina. Uh, Brittany, do you wanna talk about how you got started and what the first step for you was? Sure. So it makes sense that I'm after Trina because Feed the People was born because of the people's grab and go. So they have helped shape a lot of mutual aid um, in Chicago. So I'm really grateful. Um, so I'm a school teacher and I'm all about education. That's what I do. And anything involved with my students, I'm, I'm ready to go uh, to help them. So um, I saw that Dominique, she had posted on her Instagram account. Um, I know Dominique through YCA um, because I run the poetry club at my school. And so I saw that she was doing a distribution site of food. And um, she had also mentioned that a lot of sites have been, or a lot of um, schools had shut down their, their food giveaways that they were doing. And I knew that my school was a central site on the South side. Um, and so I literally text my principal and asked, um, you know, do, are we still passing out food? We're a noble school. So I wasn't sure if it may be different um, from CPS. And he said that they had uh, stopped um, passing out food, free food for students. Um, and so then uh, I reached out to Dominique because she asked, does anybody else want to do this? Let me know, I can help you. So I reached out to her immediately and she gave me every single tip that I needed to do. Um, and probably the, I mean, the first thing I did was I reached out to someone who was already doing it. Um, and I guess uh, the other thing I would like to sort of emphasize that Trina mentioned as well is that I was thinking about where I'm located, like where do I already do work at? And I'm, I practically live in Roseland because I spend the majority of my day teaching there and there overnight sometimes. So um, it made sense for me to, to do, to pass out meals there because um, I'm thinking about my students and their needs in that community. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how I got started. Thank you. Tim Dot, you want to tell us about your journey? Um, yeah, so how y'all doing? My name is Tim Dot. Uh, I also started out of the people's grab and go. So uh, let me explain. So. Uh, when after the after the um, protests and riots happened, um, I was trying to figure out ways that I could utilize a platform that I have and still help people in any way that I can. Um, and yeah, I seen that they were having something at Burke Elementary, and I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm gonna come down and help. So I came down and helped, and I was there for <clears throat> first couple of days. Uh, I mean, I'm st I still be there, but. Uh, I came the first couple of days and um, just seeing it transition from one team just uh, like 
you know, snack packs and things of that sort, the people wanting like full fledged groceries. Um, and the first thing that popped in my head was like, okay, what about people who can't get here? And I'm like, okay, well, let me try to create some sort of bridge in between what they already have going on and what is still currently happening every day. So literally, uh, I think um, I left the people's grab and go one day and I was like, all right, cool. There needs to be something also as well for people who can't get here. It's still COVID going on. People still are scared to leave their house. Their grocery stores aren't open. Everyone can't make it to these donation sites. So I'm like, all right, um, let me then start using any resources I have. I start calling people and I just start taking bread out of my pocket and was like, all right, cool. We about to just start delivering groceries. So let's just set this up. Let's figure out a way for people to contact us so we can start delivering. Um, so I think the first step for me was working with people who already have something going on so I can see where I can fit in rather than trying to create something completely new and it oversteps what anyone else is doing. Thank you. Thank y'all. Um, I just want to kind of highlight from that the people's grab and go. And I, I don't quote me. I don't think this has been fact checked, but it seems to be one of the first ones that popped up. And I don't think it matters who's first, but it's important. Um, Trina's first step was to show up. Right. And I think Trina can echo um, the first couple of days of that. It was like a scramble trying to figure out how to organize it. But um, as long as you show up, it turns into something and then it grows. It like literally like turned into the site I set up, what Brittany set up, what Femdot set up. And that's really incredible. Um, but I, this is another question for everyone on the panel. And uh, Brittany, you can, you can start us off with this one. You talked about it a little bit already because you teach in Roseland, but I think it's important for us to remember and always recognize how big Chicago is. And so every neighborhood is different um, and every neighborhood needs different things. So can you talk about how your project was informed by the neighborhood you were serving and why you decided to set up, why you set up? Yeah, um, thank you for that question. Um, so I was thinking about students. I'm just very student oriented. And so I think one of the things that may have been slightly unique about my choice um, coming from a teacher's perspective is I was trying to include my students um, into doing this. Um, my personal vision for life is to help students think about what they can do in their own neighborhoods, um, because I think like movements really do start with the youth. And I'm moving out of that. I mean, I look it, but I am. Um, so I, I wanted them to be involved in that. And my hopes was someone would like be like, I want to like take charge of this because I knew I couldn't sustain it. Um, that didn't happen. But I think it inspired a lot of my students to uh, realize like that they could do something like this. I mean, they know little old me. They see me up and down the hallways doing regular stuff. Um, so I think they were able to visualize and see that something that impactful can happen with just one person wanting to do it and like asking for help for others to do it. Um, so that probably was the most unique thing um, about the site um, down in Roseland. Um, I had some students that, well, I had one student that was a DJ uh, for the music there. Um, and then most of the other students just sort of passed out um, groceries, so yeah. Trina, can you talk about why you decided to set up at Burt? Yes. So um, when we looked at, like, when we initially looked at that, um, the, like, grab and go meal site, we just identified the network where we lived. And then we chose a school that was in a high traffic area because we recognized that a lot of the people who um, are who want like would want to come to the free food distribution site or free toiletries, whatever you know, all of the things that we provide. We knew that they were not our audience on social media, so it was incredibly important that we were in a place where people could see us and that we were in a in a neighborhood where we lived. And I think this piece that you mentioned earlier, Brittany, is really important. This like self determination piece, where it's like you know. Every time a grab and go happens, we tell them exactly who we are and like 
what we stand for. And whenever we say it, they're like, oh, what organization? Like, what nonprofit? What group? And we're like, we're just the people. You know, we are just a group of young people who live in this community who decided that we were going to pull up um, and, and make an impact. Um, so that's how we chose. That's why we chose uh, Burke Elementary. Um, and that's location wise. And yeah, that's why we chose Burke Elementary location wise. Thank you. Um, Fem, can you, were you delivering or are you delivering just to one particular neighborhood or does it expand to any neighborhood in Chicago? And can you talk about why is it either or? Um, yeah, we deliver to pretty much um, any neighborhood, mostly on the south and west sides predominantly. Um, and the reason why actually is because we shop on the north side. So I'm really big on uh, access and resources and um, driving through the south side and then driving through like Lincoln Park and seeing how quick you can get to a grocery store how quick you can get to these these areas to get what you need um, it was like okay let's take the resources from Lincoln Park and redistribute it to the south and west side um, and since we are delivery so people have cars so they're able to come up north and part of Part of the um, part of the the experience of delivering is being able to see the clear cut difference between the access um, that's available. So, yeah, so that's pretty much where it came from. But yeah, we deliver to really everywhere um, within the city limits and at the city borders. Um, but the reason why we at least shop up north is to literally take the resources and redistribute them in real time. Cool. Um, so I guess one of the main purposes of this public newsroom is we hope that people feel empowered to go out and kind of start their own projects. Um, so we're going to get into some of the how to's. So I know that this is not like a solo endeavor and um, it takes a lot of teamwork, a lot of volunteers. So Trina, could you talk about how you manage volunteers? That's a really great question. So I think even be like the part before volunteers, because like it feels like all of us are volunteers, it's like making sure you spread out the leadership and like the like em empower other people who are also volunteers to like take ownership and like make decisions and contribute um, to whatever it is that you're working on. Um, that was really important because like I knew I, this is not something that I could have like done with just my brain um, for well, when I think about volunteers, I think about the fact that like, so I created this Google form that was like, you know, if you want to volunteer for the people's grab and go like fill out this form and then we asked like a series of questions. But then at the end of the day, Matt took those responses like Matt and well, all of us did a little bit of like being intentional about giving it the link to specific people because we didn't want to just like put a link on the internet um, and just have like an outpour of people who are like signing up for things and not really understand or have a, a, a relationship with them. We believe like these, these, this relationship piece with volunteers is really, really important. Of course, like people who we don't know can come and like eventually become volunteers. And that happened at our site and I'll get into that. Um, but like when we first started doing the volunteers things, it was like we had to identify people who we knew wanted to plug in at the, um, or who we could have honest conversations with and then send them the link and then have them send it to maybe trusted people to fill out. And then the volunteers that we have are pretty regular. We have like a squad of volunteers who are always there to do backpacking the day before. So we go to Mariano's, pick up our order, go to the north side um, site, bagging site, and then we just like have, I think maybe like 10 people, 10 or so more or less come every week and they do the, the bag packing for the, um, for the 200 folks. We all wear masks, you know, we all have hand sanitizer, we have snacks. But again, it's about the relationship because we also have fun while we're doing it, we're playing music, et cetera. And then on the day of, at 10 a.m., we pull up to the site, you know, we're like building the can. I remember when we first got the canopy, shout out to Femme, because first we had two, two tents 
And I think Reseda actually got one of those tents. We were using Reseda's tent for a while, but um, them got us this massive canopy. And so, you know, when you have a large canopy, you need help setting that up. I think B. Rose gave us some tables too, because we were exchanging tables back and forth between our mutual aid efforts. And so having people set up the tables where, they're, where they belong, that takes about seven people. And then it's like, once the distribution starts, it's like there's like squads in the back of the of the table who are like passing out the groceries, bag cutting eggs, um, bagging water, and then there's the other side the, the hygiene squad who are doing the diapers, and then there's like three three volunteers who take people's bags to their cars if they need help, or maybe walk them to the crib if it's not too far away. Um, we have a counter who comes and sit and just literally counts how many people come up to come to the site. Um, and so it was really like volunteers were, was all about relationship building and all about people who were committed to uh, doing one thing consistently. It's like, you don't have to show up and do everything. All you have to do is come here and sit on this, on this chair and count and pass out masks. All you have to do is stand here and if somebody need help with their bags, you go ahead and they're grabbing and, and give it to them. All you have to do is show up on a Sunday and just like participate in helping bagging. Um, so that's a really, I think, I think that would be my, my best, my, oh, my last thing that I really want to highlight about volunteers is um, we eventually had, so on site, you know, there would be people who would come early, and there's one person I want to highlight, his name is Jarmel, he is from the community, and he saw us setting up the canopy that first day, I keep pointing to film, he's on this side of me, um, and ever since he came to help us set up that canopy, he has been coming back ever since. And not only does he come to like help set up, but he also stays throughout the rest of the day helping people get their groceries to their cars. And then he leaves, he, we put his bag to the side with his milk, meat and eggs. And then he leaves at the end of the day, but it's always so, it's just so rewarding when you see it's about re relationships, you know, you know it's, it's like, and even if they're random, if they're random people at first, it's like no, building a relationship with them so that they keep coming back. Um, Cause that's what really matters about consistency. Yeah, uh, thank you for saying that relationships are so important. Um, just to go back to what you were saying about the sharing of the tables and stuff. Because when we started on, um, on 95th Street, we didn't have any tables, right? And so we were getting tables from you and you and Brittany were exchanging tables and we were exchanging tents. I was getting calls like, you got the keys to the U-Haul truck, we're sharing like vans and stuff. And so connection is so important within the community, but also within like other groups of people who are doing this work um, and maintaining it. But Brittany, could you talk about how you manage donors and donations? Sure. If you don't mind, I actually want to like be vulnerable, not vulnerable, but like real here and say, I can give you some don'ts for volunteers. <laughs> because I didn't have the best, it wasn't terrible, but I, it wasn't the best way to go about volunteering. Um, and so my volunteers, most of them I did not know. And a lot of it was very like on the fly, let's just do it now. As soon as we get here, let's like figure it out. And it always worked itself out. And I think we definitely built relationships with the, like I think the people that mattered the most, which was people in the community. Um, and similarly, there were folks who would just see us there every week and just started volunteering with us just because they saw us there and they lived there. Um, so that was beautiful. But um, there were people who were arriving that I didn't know super well. And so communicating like my whys or some of the like uh, ways in which we are giving out groceries was difficult to do because I haven't I hadn't built the relationship with them. Um, there was a desire to make sure that the face of people who were passing out looked like the community. So meaning that black people were passing out bags to folks and black people were talking to folks primarily. And obviously there are all kinds of people coming to volunteer. It was very difficult to have conversations with folks who were non-black to talk to them about the way we wanted our site to look because I hadn't built the relationships. Um, and I'm sure it was very possible to do, but again, I was like really at capacity during that time. And so I just did what I could do. Um, and I also knew that my site was gonna be only for four weeks. Um, and so I let it run that way. So that's just a thing, like, please make sure you build relationships. What Trina said is very important. Um, managing donors is tricky because um, one thing is most time donors, they want to see like, 
who you're passing out to. They want to see the pictures. They want to like know where your, their money is going. And I refused to take pictures of anybody who, rece who was receiving groceries. I just felt like that was not appropriate uh, and not what I wanted to do. And so we tried to institute counting how many people we had going, but it was just, our site was just organized chaos. So sometimes it just didn't really happen. So we did it based off of like how many bags we passed out and then like how many jugs of gallons and stuff we did. So that was how we like sort of um, figure out a way to give, um, what am I trying to say? Like a, a quantitative uh, way of knowing what we were doing. Um, so yeah, I would just like keep a list um, and I tried to connect people to my Instagram account and I would post pictures of either the volunteers or the bags that we were passing out and I would just give a short reflection. Um, but people were always super excited to give um, and every, every week the donations grew. Um, and so it, it sort of confirmed for me that you did not need to show people like who exactly you're passing it out to. Um, as long as you're showing like that you're doing work, you're giving some kind of data to your, uh, your donors, I think it, it can be enough. So that's the way we kind of manage donations. And they sent all the money to me and I just counted it up every week and then went and spent it. Um, and then I had one other volunteer who was like uh, super connected to the community, um, showed up every week and we were building a relationship with. So I started to trust him with um, doing some of the groceries and things like that. So yeah. Tell us about your milk donations too. Tell us about that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I had a, um, I had a, so I, I work with a teacher who started like a, um, uh, what is it called? Basically like a community organization. Um, oh no, she started a book club for students on the South side. Super cool. Anyway, she's just plugged in with people everywhere. And she saw me posting about my site. And I think this was like maybe the second week in. And she was like, yo, I'm connected to this woman who knows this like um, food pantry all the way in Aurora, but she can bring you the stuff. Long story short, that didn't happen. I ended up, I wanted to get the, the stuff so bad. So I ended up uh, renting a, a U-Haul truck and having to go like first thing in the morning, day of the distribution site to the uh, food pantry and they gave us every week around 400 gallons of milk. It was insane. It was very stressful too because I was always scared it was gonna spoil and we would just be wasting milk. And so as soon as I would get the truck out there, I wasn't waiting for a setup, nothing. I would open up the thing and I would be standing out there like free milk, free milk. Uh, we would pass out that milk like it was, I don't know, anything you pass out quick. So it was, yeah, but ev every week, it was gone. A lot of times the milk and the cheese and the meat was gone before the grocery bags. Um, so people really um, desired that. Um, so I was just thankful for uh, the food pantry. I can't remember their name. I think Trina, you may know to shout them out, but they, yeah, they just gave it to us and we're like, yup, go ahead, do what you do. Do you remember Trina, their name? I'm terrible. I think it's the Aurora, Aurora food pantry. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah. Thank y'all. We only have like eight, seven minutes left. I have so many questions. I know we can talk about this for a long time, um, but I'm going to open this up to whoever wants to answer. Uh, where does food distribution and mutual aid work fit in the overall movement for Black Lives? Um, and then I, a second part to that question is, are these free food sites uh, revolutionary in your eyes? Is there a way that we or even a desire to shift the burden of these sites from the people to government um and what would that look like i know that's a really like heavy three-part question but anyone who wants to answer can, can tackle it i guess i could start um i think uh food distribution and mutual aid is is extremely imperative to black lives because the idea of black lives matter means that you're keeping people you know you got to keep people healthy you got to keep people fed you have to take care of these communities. You have to provide resources and access to these communities. A lot of the issues that we have is rooted because there aren't access or resources to begin with. And if you wanna see uh, real change in what's going on, then um, changing the communities and the situations around you is how it's gonna happen. And I think uh, feeding somebody is, I mean, on a spiritual level, like, you know, if you feed somebody, like, you know, it, it hits different. So being able to, uh, I think feed people um, and distribute food creates a different sense of trust. Cause it's like, you're helping somebody technically like build their home, you know, like 
you know, like having food in your home damn near makes your home a home. Um, so I think that's very imperative in terms of just creating community in general. Um, so in, in order to make change, you need to create community. So I think it all kind of plays really well together. Who else wants to? Yeah, I'm gonna chat. <laughs> you know, Brittany, y'all want to add to that or? He did that, okay. <laughs> all right. Pretty much. <laughs> Um, one more question, then we're going to um, open it up for people on the call to ask questions. And I'm going to ask for um, you to put your question in the chat, and I will tap it and call it out. Um, our last question to wrap up, um, our, our questions. I'm, sure, I'm like, I have so many. Which one do I want to do? Um, I guess this is really important, and Brittany, you touched on this a little bit. Um, Again, anyone who wants to answer can answer. What advice would you have for people who are non-Black, who want to get involved in mutual aid work and say they're trying to do mutual aid in a community they're not from or um, you know, the people there don't reflect what they look like? Yeah, uh, I really believe, like, especially if you hold an immense amount of privilege in whatever community you're working on, you should be as far, as far behind the scenes as possible. <laughs> um, primarily, like if you know you got access to finances like that, get the money, like start calling your friends and do the money work. Cause that's most of the work, like finding donations and money um, and, and seeing how you can support uh, the folks like the black and brown folks or the people who are actually frontline, how can you support them and make sure they can continue doing that work? Um, but my, my uh, biggest recommendation is to be as far behind the scenes as possible um, if you hold a lot of privilege because it can be damaging and uh, can communicate a lot of things if you are the one that's on the front lines primarily. Now it depends on what, it, what you mean by front lines because sometimes we do need like people protecting black and brown people with their privilege. But in the case of mutual aids, I would say, yeah, just work on donors or something like that. <laughs> just to add one thing to that too. Um, yeah, like your plan should not be to step on anybody's toes. Like do not step on anyone's toes. Also people, even if you're just working in a, communi in a community you're not from, in the neighborhoods you're not from, you may not have the trust of the neighborhood that you're from, or that, of the neighborhood that you're in, right? Um, the main, you need to, like, if somebody's already doing work in that community or you're joining with somebody who's doing work in that community, they already have the relationships established. So there's a certain way that you have to move and you have to respect that. Like, you do not want to, because if you step on somebody's toes or try to, you know, go over people, then, like, it looks conflicting in terms of, like, the actual organization itself. And then that does not uh, present a, a situation that's welcoming to the people you're trying to help. So don't step on nobody's toes. My only thing would say is impact over intention. We have a lot of good intentions. I think a lot of people in the world have really good intentions. They don't mean harm. But when you recognize, like, if your impact by your presence, by your actions, by how you d decide or desire to show up for people is negative, then acknowledging that and then taking a step back. Thank y'all. Uh, we have an audience question from Jamie from Block Club, Chicago. Um, to the panel, what has been the greatest challenge in building your mutual aid network? Trina, why don't you answer? <laughs> So the greatest challenge is showing up on a regular basis. But honestly, we have so much fun and we just love each other so much that like it stopped being a challenge. Like honestly, the Honestly, the biggest challenge was like getting into a rhythm because in the beginning, and I, I know you were y'all, all y'all remember because y'all have y'all had come. It was kind of like it was wild those first few times. It was like food everywhere. Like, you know, we had boxes of granola bars, gummy bears, like, you know, all of these things. And how are we, you know, we, we were working with a U-Haul truck at first instead of doing a long term rental with the Enterprise truck. We had not learned that we need to pack bags on Sundays before we were like packing bags like um 
on site or like around the corner on the day of like it was you know it was a lot but then once we got into a rhythm and we recognized that we all had roles and we stepped into those roles then it became it became um it became like a well-oiled machine and so really at that point it's only like okay you know we have fun on a monday and on a sunday too but it's like oh i can't do this thing because like because my time i'm committed to this thing like i can't leave or like i can't it's so that was really like the challenge but really because we loved it so much and we continued i mean like we continue to just build and have fun it's like not it's not as challenging as it was when we first started Thank you, Trina. Um, here's another audience question from Cordell. What is the long-term, or do you have a long-term goal of turning your mutual aid site into a nonprofit as a way to redirect resources to black and brown communities? I think Trina pointed at Finn, so. Um, well, yes. Um, so uh, the Scholar Slide-By is actually now just a part of a larger initiative that I have called Delacom Scholars, which is a nonprofit. Like, um, so the plan is to create, I mean, the, cause I did, when we all probably, when we all started this, no one knew how long we were going to sustain this. And that was probably one of the challenges too. I think because of finding a rhythm and organizing, you have to figure out like, how can we actually sustain this? How much money is, is going to keep us afloat? You know, we have, uh, everyone has other things going on. So once, um, we were able to kind of figure out how to sustain this throughout the summer, um, just in terms of what I know what we're doing, um, we're like okay every summer people are going to need food it's unfortunate that's that's the unfortunate reality right so um we were like all right how can we incorporate to this what i'm already doing on a whole other front to then you know spend the year taking in donations taking in resources and and and, and for people to know that year as years go along this is what we're going to do so um yeah we definitely plan to sustain and continue it throughout the summer, but it just also so happened that I had a nonprofit to begin with that I could just kind of attach this to. Trina or Brittany, are y'all planning to turn into nonprofits? No. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, so Trina brought that up, like people would always be like, so what organization is this? And sometimes people would like fight me to like, they'd be like, you need to make this an organ, and I'm like, I think they thought I didn't know that I could create a 501c3 and that I could connect with the automan. I was like, I know all of those things. I'm purposely doing it this way. Um, and so, yeah, that's not, I mean, my work is in education primarily. And, and obviously like food is an extension of that. Like that is important. My students are not eating, they're not going to learn. Um, but I, I know I should do work that's more closely aligned with like uh, teaching um i would love to empower someone now that i know what it takes what i would love to empower someone or like mentor someone or work with someone to do it in that community um but that's not something that i think is like in my long-term vision for work that i do in community so now nah. yeah i um <clears throat> so i just graduated from my mass with my master's and like i primarily went to get my master's because i do data analysis and so like very you know i love the people's grab and go and i i think like it was a, it is really important and i don't think this is the end of it but i also don't believe that we need to have a 501c3 status right in order to do things and i feel like sometimes we could get bogged down in the paperwork and we're like we have to do these things first when actually we could just do it and it, and it seems like film is like i stay prepared so i don't have to get prepared and so when this happened it just kind of all fell into place and i honored that because like that's a part of his long-term work, right? Because like food has been, become a part of something much, you know, that he is, he is doing and like that he's committed to doing. And the work that I do is around police accountability and police misconduct at the Invisible Institute. Like I do data analysis, use of force analysis, complaint data, like, um, like th this is this is all also really important as we as we talk about the movement for black lives and so like i'm very excited that like people are doing more than us are doing food stuff you know what i mean and and like we really in my mind i'm like the state should be doing this and like we've just developed a model um to let the state know that this is something they could easily do this is something that people clearly need because the same people keep coming to the people's grab and go site every single week 
for three months now, right? So like the state, the, this is the this is the the the, the state right now. If you were looking to at, if you were looking to look at the budget, you would see that like they they de depend on philanthropy in order to provide services to people they spend so much money on like if you look at the the money that comes out of the city city council's budget like the city's budget um the money that is coming out of the city's budget is not for like services department of family support services gets their most of their money from philanthropy philan philanthropy i'm sorry not from the state and like that's a problem like we shouldn't be leaning on philanthropy to be doing this we shouldn't be leaning on 501c3s to do this like we need to defund the police and invest in, we need to defund the police and invest in this, right? Because that's what keeps people safe. Like that's what keeps people like not desperate in these times, you know, like I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do the most right here. I know we got limited time. Do, do the most. Yes, I mean like, like we know, we know like violence prevention, police do not, police do not keep us safe. Police do not keep black communities safe. Um, and we know that like if we want to reduce crime, like we know that there are some clear resources that you can contribute to. Like if you were to combine clean water, streets and sanitation, housing, public health, and the, um, the Department of Family and Support Services budget, if you were to combine all five of their budgets, you still wouldn't have the amount of money that CPD gets from the city of Chicago. That's a problem. And like as long as we're investing 40% of our budget into things like police, instead of investing into things that like keep people education food housing things that like literally keep people safe like we are we're going to constant we're going to see things get worse cuz we're living in a global pandemic right now so like the things are just progressing worse thank you so much for that thank all of y'all this is that was our last question i think that was a really good point an important point to end on um, i'm going to toss it back to ellie who's going to walk us through our next part of the agenda. Awesome. Thank you all so much for those insights. Um, I can't think of uh, an effort that would sort of teach me so much in such a short amount of time as the pop-up pantries and food distribution efforts that y'all are running. And so I really appreciate you um, sharing that uh, those lessons with us. Um, welcome back, everyone. Um, so now we have uh, a little bit of time just to sort of debrief um, on the on the discussions that we just had. I'm curious, would anyone like to just go ahead and unmute themselves and share um, either a mutual aid project that you or someone on your team maybe thought about and how you might work through one of the challenges in seven? Uh, or just anything that stood out for you from your conversation. This is Harry. Uh, so, something that jumped out to me from our conversation was just the difference between mutual aid projects that are like like public, like for basic needs, especially like right now when it's so uh, visible and everybody can like feel that everybody's hurting versus mutual aid that's more like behind the scenes or about kind of Skillshare infrastructure um like I, I was thinking about the actually something that uh everybody on the panel was mentioning about like the behind the scenes work and the infrastructure um and just honestly like how how messed up and inadequate the infrastructure is to support work like this um so th that was my idea was like some like bookkeeping collaborative or like legal resources that are more informal than you know getting an attorney to figure out what the best ways to organize and uh, get organized and stay safe around the work um, but yeah, it just jumped out to me that it's a, it's different to think about mutual aid on different scales. Like if you're if you're launching a big um, like the grab and go versus something that could be much more uh, intimate and small scale among people that you know. Totally. And did you um, just out of curiosity? Oh, sorry, Trina. Were you going to say something? I was just going to uplift that I actually called Harry Backlund when the People's Grab and Go first started because I was like, we got all this money here. What are we supposed to do with it? Like, where should it live? And that was really, um, so I'm really happy that you uplifted that, Harry. And we worked together as bookkeepers before. Yeah, we should just do this, Trina. I got, I got no excuses, so. All right. Anyone else? Can I add something? 
So in our group, what we sort of talked a little bit about the whole idea of um, those sort of public facing people doing public facing work versus people staying in the background and people with privilege staying kind of doing the supporting work um, and trying to kind of get a handle on like how, what are different strategies you can use to really um, sort of incentivize people to do that because the, um, you know, the, 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 the work that is really nourishing to your, to your soul emotionally is the work of, that, act, that connects you with people, like feeding people, giving people food, giving, you know, working, meet, talking to them one-on-one -on -one is the stuff that is kind of gives you the juice and um, doing fun, nobody likes doing fundraising. So like how, like what are the different strategies you could, that we could use to kind of, um, other than just appealing to people sort of like better angels or whatever, um, like what can you do to sort of make that seem, seem fulfilling in some way? Yeah, I'd be really curious to hear yeah. from any of the organizers on the panel, because I know that that's something that, um, that came up for you all. So if you have any sort of tips to share around that. So um, there are two orga um, people who volunteer with the People's Grab and Go every Sunday with bag packing. And they just had a lot of fun packing the bags. Like that is something that is behind the scenes work that was like really important preparation. And it also gave them an opportunity to bond and build relationships with people, other volunteers who were like black volunteers or volunteers of color. And I think this was particularly important because like a lot of people, because we live in a very segregated world, a very like the, the way that things are built up, like um, there are many cases where people actually harm folks that they're providing goods to without without intending to harm them. And I think that is like in language, I think that's like if something wild happens on the site and like the, the way that they respond, like when one time somebody who was like on drugs walked up to our site and we was like, okay, how are we gonna engage with this, right? So it's like, um, what the, I think the first step in like before engaging in a community, especially like communities where you're like, you've never been before, or even, I mean, like there were teachers who were from Burke who wanted to do work at the people's grabbing on. We had them doing things like packing the bags on site. That was before they, before we started packing bags in other places, but it was really important for, um, for like them to know that like they can feel good by packing packing bags and building relationships with the people who are like a part of the mutual aid effort and that is um that is the very important thing um and it has a really significant impact um even beyond like the kind of thing like the feels good like oh i'm passing someone like a food thing which i feel you same right but like we we don't want to put people in positions where they might accidentally harm a community member so we prioritize that but the back you know the, the couple who was packing the bags, we was playing music, we were dancing together, we had really good conversations, we like have a relationship now. And, and now that that has happened, like I would feel way more comfortable with them coming to the site, right? Because like we built this trust beforehand so that when we're on the site, if something goes down, we, they, we trust each other to be able to respond appropriately or to provide feedback in that moment. I'd also like to add that I don't think fundraising like is a unsexy thing unless you like make it that. I think, I mean, the way in which I was fundraising was I was making nice flyers for Instagram. Like that stuff is fun and like responding to people's like questions. So it's not like you are like not only like talking or dealing with money and not people like you are dealing with people because they're going to ask you questions about like what they're donating to. And so you're still communicating um, I think there is like a fun, is, a, a fun part to it. Um, I think it's just how you envision what fundraising is. It's not like just spreadsheets and like, this is how much money you got, this is how much you can spend. Um, so yeah, even like grocery shopping was really fun to me. I mean, filling up those carts with like, like a hundred and something cans, I never get to do that. So that was like, I feel like I was on supermarket sweep or something like that. So um, I, I think a lot of, like, like Trina said, I think a lot of the process is really fun. I think it just depends on the way in which you, you do it and engage with it. And if you're intentional about making it joyful. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I think to your point, I mean, like, um, 
being able, like somebody who's passionate, being able to explain, like if somebody's asking, oh, we're trying to donate. And like, if you're talking to somebody who doesn't, is not really passionate about what's going on, but if you're like passionate about like the cause, it's a very good conversation with the donor. Cause it's like, yo, I know we really trying to help people. This is really how this happening. Like, yo, you ever, you ever had it? You ever seen some romaine lettuce in the bag? Like, you can have a full, you know, conversation with somebody. Um, that really sells that point. And uh, I know like with us, we do a lot of, um, so with the families that we talk to, we have to be call them to give them a heads up of like, okay, this is your delivery time or whatever. And it'd be the sweetest people. Like, so a lot of people who we have, who can't make it out to deliver will just call for us. But it's like, they'll be like, man, these conversations were so great just because like, one, they're real people. And you can be like, wow, these, they're, they're you know, like they're the kindest people or they're the sweetest people or something. So there are other elements um that may not you know uh look as appealing initially but then while you're in while you're in the midst of it you realize just how rewarding that small part is and how important it is to the larger scope of what's going on mm -hmm. um since we are coming up on the last few minutes of of this call i wanted to well kick it back to Brittany to share your um idea that you held off on, first of all. Yeah, it was just a, a question that came up in um, FemDi. I kind of want to pass it to you. It was a question that I had, and you know, you can jump into, um, or obviously it's open to anyone. Um, but um, in the group that I was in, um, I think his name was Mark. Yeah, he shared, you know, I, I definitely understand the, the significance of um, going to the north side to get groceries and bringing them out to the south side and i was about that too but then i was thinking through like well shouldn't stores on the south side be supported so that they can sustain themselves and people can start going mm -hmm. back to them um i wanted to just know like him what was your rational uh how did you rationalize that how did you think through that um and then anyone else can jump in trina or anyone else so how we pretty much rationalize was one location um because where we shop there are a bunch of grocery stores directly next to each other so we can get everything on the list so um you know like with a lot of places out south there'll be one grocery store that pretty much has to serve like three like three communities you know what i'm saying so if we can't get everything at that grocery store um then now the person we're delivering to isn't able to get everything they ask for so with us, um, outside of just literally redistributing resources, it was like, okay, how can we make sure, because of the personalized listing, people to feel as if like somebody cares enough to get them exactly what they want. So if we have a location in which we can go from an Audi to a Jewel to a Mariano's and a half of my radius, which is wild as hell, which is like the fact that that's only in certain areas. But the reality is if that's in that area and we know we can get all of those things specifically for this, because that also like, speaks to the um to how much we care about the person we're delivering to and how much we value what they want um so that's kind of why why we stem there but that's a really good point and i thought about that like trying to go out south um to try to grab and stuff and keep stuff going um but it was just with the gaps in how many grocery stores are next to each other and then when we originally started and realizing like oh you're probably gonna have to get something at another store you might not get everything in one store and that then you know, we may have to drive another 15 minutes to get to the next grocery store to find whatever else is going on. Um, so that's pretty much where that stems from. Um, I would also add that, like, that's a problem of the state. Like, we live in food deserts, right? And then, like, if we are doing these grocery deliveries and we're getting a whole lot of goods, a, a whole lot of the same thing we could just literally like destroy their whole stock of what they have i mean there were so many times because we shop at mariano's on 39th and king we have to put in our order a couple of days in before and it's different right because like we have this like large bulk order but even then when we put in our order days in advance they don't always have everything that we need and we end up having to go to restaurant depot we end up having to go and go to costco like they also don't have everything like all of the kinds of products that we're looking for and so it's just like th this is the, this is an issue with the state like it's like how do we like tell them that they need to get more 
grocery stores, like more diversity in grocery stores in these neighborhoods. And also like a lot of these stores are not owned by black people or people of color, period. They are just like franchise it. I mean, um, large corporate brands that that like have have been have only come. I mean, like have had to be incentivized to be built there in the first place, and then even then don't hold the quality of stuff that they that they what that we would want them to have. Mm. Yeah. Thank you for closing us out on that really thoughtful question. Um, I want to be mindful of time. So before I give my own sort of closeout spiel, I wanted to ask Brady, Femdot, Trina, are, what are the ways that we can be continuing to engage in this work and continuing to support your work? I am, so the um, Feed the People is uh, no longer running. Um, it's running in our hearts, but <laughs> not physically. Um, so um, I, I know that there are some sites um, on the South side, definitely a bunch. And so um, I can put my Instagram handle on there. If folks are interested in supporting those, I can send that their way. And um, yeah, I could do that. Um, but I am supporting efforts with the People's Grab and Go. Uh, we're raising funds for books um and care packages and that's something that will continue throughout the year to support students um, to have their own libraries um and so they can deal with the stress of zoom um i can just put the information in the chat or send it to you because i don't know it off the top of my head <laughs> yeah if you want to add it to the agenda later on i think that'll be a good okay. resource for folks yeah perfect should i go yeah, go okay. for it. <laughs> so one, shout out Dela Crim Scholars. You over here now. Fem. Shout, shout out Fem Dot and uh, Dela Crim Scholars. I think like that is just like a baby budding into just like beautiful things. And I'm, I'm sure that over time we'll see it evolve and grow and shift um, as Fem is growing and as his team is growing. Um, so I just, I want to honor that because he do have the 501c3, you know, um, I also want to plug my partner, 360 Nation, W.D. Floyd, he works with, he, he develops Black young people on the west side of Chicago, I think they, they're like, I really believe in their work, I believe in the philosophy, and I believe in their values, um, and they're like, building a whole bunch of beautiful things so shout out them and then like again yeah the grab and go will be doing this book book library clay mental health like support for young folks who are within our network and so by way of like donations or by way of connecting us with like other teachers maybe who who you know just like because i have a feeling that it'll be something that will happen for for a long time because we will be remote learning for a while and we'll have to be really creative about how we educate um, young folks. That's me. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you all for having me. This is super cool, you feel me? Shout out to y'all. Uh, and um, yeah, so we still have uh, Delacram Scholar Slybys, we actually have they're coming up again this weekend. Um, and then we're doing uh, our last two for the summer, exactly, which will be um, the weekend of September 12th and the weekend of September 27th. Um, so we do accept volunteers. So um, on our site, I'll put that in the chat at delacramscholars.org, or you like answer a series of questions, we'll contact you and give you more information. Uh, we will be accepting donations as well. Um, especially because after we finish the slide buys in September, we start prepping for uh, the scholarship. So I give a black and brown scholarship. Uh, I mean, still a scholarship to black and brown college students either born in Chicago or going to Chicago in the area. Um, we award them in the middle of the year. So they have funding because, you know, that's when like, you know, your uh, fast foot is you're waiting on your fast foot to come in or you're waiting on, you know, your financial aid to hit. So we will be accepting donations for that as well as the slide by. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much what's really going on on the scholar scholar tip. So yeah, feel free to donate your time or your treasure. We do accept both. Oh, the last grab and go is on Monday. 
By the way, our last Grabbing People's Grab and Go is on Monday. Shout out to Sarah Conway for staying with us in the rain that first day. Um, and please feel free to follow us on social media. We have an Instagram, The People's Grab and Go, where we'll likely highlight other folks. Yep. Awesome. Thank you guys so, so much once again for participating in this panel and sharing um, all of your insights with us. And I know she's not on the call anymore, but also a big shout out to Rosita for uh, being a moderator who's also um, not just a great moderator, but also has some firsthand experience with um, this work. Uh